بسم الله الحمد لله صلى الله وصلى الله عليه وصحبه وسلم إن شاء الله today we'll go over باب الحضانة or the chapter on physical custody and these are the points that we will cover today introduction order of deserving relatives hindrances our موانع from deserving the حضانة hindrances the opposite of hindrances would be what conditions شروط when we talk about موانع we talk about شروط because you have to have the شروط and you have to not have the mawana. You should have to have the conditions and you should, you should not have the hindrances. Conditions are necessary for the ruling to be applicable. Conditions, the absence of the, uh, that's the presence of the conditions is necessary. The absence of the hindrances or mawana is necessary. And then we will talk about one of the, one of the uh, uh, mawana or hindrances is the marriage of the mother. Um, and we will talk about this in some detail as well. And then we will talk about the end of Havana when the Havana ends, and we will talk about visitation rights and arrangements. Uh, we will uh, start by an introduction, even before we go over Mihon bin Qudama's introduction. Which he, he did not introduce the book, he just started by mentioning the order of the deserving servants. Uh, but I said here in the commentary that Havana could be translated as custody, tutelage, or foster care. It entails caring for the child, safeguarding him or her, and managing his or her day-to-day -day affairs until a certain age. The child will be spending the nights with the one entitled to his or, fi or her physical custody. And that is by definition what physical custody means. Where is he, uh, you know, sleeping? At whose home? Is he uh, or she is sleeping, uh, or you know, spending the nights? I chose physical custody. I chose the word physical physical custody to point out to the presence of two other types of custody. Physical custody is al hadana, al wilaya al jasad, al wilaya al jasad. Physical custody, al hadana, al wilaya al jasad. But there are two different types of wilaya or custody uh, or guardianship that are not mentioned here. One of them is al wilaya ala nafs one, and the other one is al wilaya ala al-mal. Al wilaya ala nafs is called al wilaya al amma or the general custody. Uh, nafs is nafs, you know, everybody knows what nafs means. So uh, guardianship ala nafs uh, is the general custody. It, it means that even though she will be left with her mother, to take care of her and to raise her and so on, but the father will be still the wali, the guardian. When she is getting married, it will still be the father who will marry her off. Uh, and when they're talking about which school she will go to, it will be the father who uh, makes the uh, decision for his uh, children. He is the wali al nafs. Uh, he is the one that will be responsible for uh, these decisions. And certainly, but, uh, you know, when it comes to logistics, it has be, to be also upon mutual agreement with the mother who will be the hadena or the uh, custodian, physical custodian, uh, because they will have to, to manage the logistics together. Also, there is a wilaya al mal or wilaya al maliya the father will still be the one to manage the assets of his children unless disqualified. If he is not disqualified, he is a ala man awlad. He has guardianship over the, the assets or the wealth property of his children. It is the father's unless he is uh, disqualified. The second thing that I mentioned here is that if the two parents are married, the hadana of the child is both their right and responsibility. So no one will be competing with them for the hadana. It will not, they will not be stripped of the hadana or the custody over the child. They are married. The child is with his parents. No one will be able to take the child away from his parents. There is no, basically, discussion here about you know, the child being with the parents. They are both responsible and entitled, uh, unless it is necessary for the safety of the child. It is determined to be necessary to take him away from the parents 
for the safety of the child. Let us say the parents are drug addicts, the child is, live, is living in miserable circumstances and so on, and it is decided. In Islam, this does happen, just like here, life is, but it, it, it would require like, like a dire need to, to, to remove the child from the parents because the parents, even if they are not particularly the best parents, will still have more compassion for their child than others. And then when the child is taken away from the parents, like by the Islamic diaphragm or something, in an Islamic setting, uh, the child will be given to the next of kin, the, the next deserving of the kin. And the child will not be given to like, like complete strangers, will be given to the next of kin. Uh, then, sure. yes. Um, two questions here. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's all coming. End of Hadana is, uh, we're coming to this, inshallah. We're just given the introduction, uh, that it will come. The next point here in the introduction is that the Hadana, uh, uh, keep in mind, if the deserving parents are in agreement even after a divorce, we will not be talking about litigation, we are not going to be talking about judging and arbitration. So if the two parents, after divorce, agree among themselves, we will keep the child with the mom. Or the mom said, no, I, you know, I'd prefer that the child would stay with you. If the two parents agreed, الحَقُّ لَا يَعْضُهُمَا You know, it, the haqq is between them. The entitlement is between them. So no one should be arguing with them about the entitlement that is exclusively between them. They agreed, the, the, the mother got married, and the father agreed to leave the children with the mother. When Umm Salama got married to the Prophet وسلم, her son, where did he go, Omar? Where did he go? He went with his mom. You know, well, even though she was married to a foreign man who was not a mahram to her, to her, to her son. Omar ibn Abi Salama stayed with his mom. Because no one argued about it, about it, you know, and, and certainly if you were in their place, his family members, and he's moving to the household of the Prophet Sallallahu you would not be very prudent if you argue about this. But, but that, that, that is what it is, that the hukm is still applicable. If the father happily leaves the children with their married mother, the entitlement is between them. So he, that's it. They'll stay with her. So where this talk about who's most deserving and the order of the most deserving kin is, is applicable only in the case of disputation. Disputation. Note that in all cases, that re and regardless of who gets custody, no child will be prevented from seeing either parents. Uh, it, that is extremely important. Whether this parent is Muslim, is not Muslim, is this or that, no child will be barred from seeing either parent. Likewise, no parent will be prevented from spending time with their children unless real harm is feared for the child's safety. And Hadana is established for the best interest of the child, the parents and all of the involved pa pa uh, parties must fear Allah and do what is best for the child. Using the issue of custody to cause harm to the ex-spouse is evil and reckless. The, the, the entire chapter, when every chapter has like a stronghold, the, the, the stronghold in this chapter is the interest of the child. The objective of this topic, chapter, discussion, is the best interest of the child. So you will even find the scholars uh, uh, overriding the order that they made for the one that's most deserving if it will not be in the best interest of the child. Yes? So with that istihaq, like it says over here, wala hadana, wala fasik. So, um, but you said that if the par parent is not 
a Muslim, you know, if they're fasting, wouldn't that, they would obviously be doing certain things that, you know, according to the Sharia, would be considered Christian, perhaps drinking or, you know, anything. anything and, and we will come to this discussion. However, what I'm saying here that al fasib will not be deserving of the Hadana, but we're talking about visitation rights, entitlement to seeing their child, not entitlement to having custody. Yeah, and that entitlement to, to see their kid is not taken away from them because of their fist. Or kofr. So let's start with, the, so this was just an introduction. Uh, let's start with, uh, you, you know, uh, Ibn, Imam Ibn Qadama's uh, statements here. He's, he's started by saying, ثم الأخت من الأبوين ثم الأخت من الأب ثم الأخت من الأم ثم الخالة ثم العمة ثم الأقرب فالأقرب من النساء ثم عصباته الأقرب فالأقرب So he basically put together the, the order according to the Hanbali Mazhab and you may not necessarily need to remember this uh, because there is so much disagreement over the order between the different mazahib and we will tell you what is agreed on, which is very little. Mm -hmm. So, the, the four mazahib agree on one thing. The mother. The mother. <laughs> and her mothers. So, mother to them means mothers. All the way up. All the way up. Uh, so mother, mother's mother, you know, maternal grandmother, and so on. All of them are more deserving than anyone else. After this, that's it. We're done. We we're, we're start the fight. Uh, so Imam al Qudama here said the most deserving of the physical custody of the child is his mother, then her mothers. All four mazahab will agree up and up to here, and then they quit agreement with each other. Um, however high. Who's his? The, the child's mother or? The child's mother. What's it? And her mothers. And then they will stop agreeing. However high, then the father, <clears throat> then the father. And the Shafi'is also do the same thing. They make the father right after the mothers. Mothers. All the mothers. Because the grandmother is a mother. In Islam, the grandmother is a mother. The, the grandfather is a father. It's called father. Oh, that is, the grandmother is a mother. So after all the mothers comes the, the father the Shafi and the Hanbali position. But that is not true in the Hanafi and Maliki position. Because after the mother, after the mothers, then will come, you know, uh, the pat paternal grandmother. After the maternal grandmothers will come the paternal grandmothers in the Maliki position. And the Hanafis will give it to women all the, all, all the way uh, before the father. So they will give it to the uh, sister, and they'll give it to the niece, and they'll give it to the aunt, and they'll give it to the paternal aunt. They'll just give it to women all the way uh, before the father. So uh, anyway, what we said here, so, so he, they said that he said the most deserving of the physical custody of the child is, is his mother, and then her mothers, however high, then the father, then his mothers, then the grandfather, then his mothers, then the full sister, then the paternal half-sister, then the maternal half-sister, then the maternal aunt, then the paternal aunt, then the closest related women, then the closest of his paternal kin. So it is basically, you know, so it, 
will be the mother and her mothers, here, mother and her mothers, and on the side, on the other side, will come the father, and then his mothers. So we're going, all of those would come as number one for the here is number two, here is number three for uh, the Hanbali Malta. The father and then the mothers of the father. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What's the difference between the mother of 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 the mother Okay, so the um, so that order, like I told you, just remember that mothers are deserving first, and then they disagree over mothers, meaning mothers and grandmothers, and then they disagree over everything else. So I said here that each madhab has its own order of entitlement to the custody. It's for the Islamic judiciary or those in place outside of the lines of Islam when sought for arbitration by the contending parties to allot the physical custody to the most qualified relatives who may actualize the best interest of the child in light of the, of the suggested orders of priority provided by the different mazahib. So we just give flexibility to the arbitrators after what is agreed on which is mothers be entitled unless they get married. Uh, after what's agreed on, we give flexibility to the, the arbitrators to determine. Okay, so now we will start to talk about the hindrances and the conditions. When is it that you, you're the custody, you will not be entitled to custody because you have one of the hindrances that would prevent you from this entitlement? Any, any questions about the order before we move on? Yeah, the, the issue of the order is clear, that the, the arbitrator will have flexibility to determine the, where, the best interest of the child. The, the, the arbitrator will not have flexibility when it comes to the unmarried mother. The unmarried mother cannot be over, like you can't really take the child from an unmarried mother, unless you fear for the safety of the child, she is like, you know, She's dangerous. Unmarried mother has been divorced? Yes. So she, she was divorced from the child's father and now she's unmarried and she's living by herself or she's living with her parents. That woman, no one can take the child, no arbitrator or judge can take the child from her because that is determined by the Sharia. Anti bihi malam tankihi. You are most deserving to him unless you get married and by unanimity. So you don't only have a nas or text of revelation or a, a, like evidence, a hadith, but you also have the unanimity of the scholars that an unmarried mother is uh, most entitled. And then they start to disagree. So since they started to disagree and there is nothing really that is uh, solid, and we're talking about the mother and her mothers also. All of those are, you know, uh, agreed on that they are more entitled. After this, they start to disagree and we don't have anything solid. In my humble opinion, you know, I believe that the, the hadith of Bint Hamza, which was reported by Bukhari and Muslim, where they sort of disputed over the custody of the, the daughter of Hamza radiallahu anhu when they uh, were leaving Mecca after the conquest of Mecca and the daughter of Hamza came out with them and they dispute, three people disputed, Zaid ibn Haritha and Jafar ibn Abi Talib and Ali ibn Abi Talib, they all disputed over her and everybody presented their sort of uh, 
proofs, proofs of entitlement or argument uh, uh, to, to, to win over the, cust to win the custody of the daughter of Hamza. Nowadays, people would be <laughs> trying to run away or hide or something. Uh, but they were uh, fighting over, uh, you know, taking care of her. So the, and then the Prophet said to Ali, "Anta minni wa ana min," and he said to Jafar, "Ashbahta khalqi wa khulqi." You're the you, you, uh, you resemble me the most in my character and my looks. And then he said, said to Ali, "Anta minni wa ana min." You're from me, and I'm from you. And then he said to Zaid, "Anta akhuna wa mablana." You're our brother and uh, our ally. Uh, but he then said, well, But the jariya will be, or the, 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 the girl will be with her aunt. And then the Prophet said, For the khala, or the maternal aunt, is just like the mother. Or it, it has the same status as the mother. Manzila is status. The khala has the same status as the mother. So I believe that the khala should be next to the mothers. So she, the, the, we should have like the mother, the grandmother, the great-grandmother, and right after the mothers, the khala. Uh, huh? I think even before the father. Yeah. Yes. So the, the person who is deserving of custody, are they obligated to take it in a sense of, can they pass it down to the next person if they don't want to for whatever reason? A very good question. So the person who is deserving to custody, can they, are they obligated to take the custody of the child? Do you think they are obligated? if it is in the best interest of the child. I would rephrase it. If it is necessary so the, for the safety or well-being of the child, then they are, they are obligated. But it is not just the best interest of the child, because uh, when it gets to the father, or when everybody, there is only one person who's obligated, the father. If there is no one else that wants to take it, no one else that wants to take it, the father is obliged to take custody, physical custody of the child. Because at the end of the day, you cannot say nobody's obligated. There is a child here. So someone would, at, at the end of the day, someone would need to be obligated. The father, by agreement, is obligated. There is no, you know, controversy over this. When is 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 is, the, is obligated. The mother is more deserving than the father, but she is not obligated. According to the majority, there are within the Hanafi and the Maliki madhabs. Within the Hanafi, not I'm not saying the Hanafi and the Maliki madhabs. Within the Hanafi and Maliki madhabs. Some scholars said the mother is also obligated. But the majority, including the popular position within the Hanafi and Maliki madhab, said the mother is not obligated because it will be an extra burden on her. Let's say that she wants to get married, let's say, you know, whatever. It will be an extra burden for, on her to, uh, to, to, unless لا يلتقم إلا ثديها, or there is no other woman who's not married to a non-mahram, who is not married to a foreign man. Uh, so, and, and the child is a, is a, is a girl. So two, two exceptions here that will make the mother obligated to take care of the child. If the child is a girl, and there is no other woman who's not married to a foreign man that will take care of that child, then the mother will end up taking it. Uh, or if, you know, the child is breastfeeding and he will not uh, nurse from any other woman. Then she's obliged to take uh, the child. Otherwise, she's not obliged. 
She's entitled, but she's not obliged. The father is less entitled, but he is obliged all the time. When there is no one else that wants to take custody, then he is obliged to, to take custody. Then Imam Abu Qadama started to talk about the hindrances. When is it that you will lose your custody because you're not deserving, because you have hindrances? And then he said, وَلَا حَضَانَةَ لِرَقِيقٍ وَلَا فَاسِقٍ وَلَا مْرَأَةٍ مُزَوَّجَةٍ لِأَجْنَبِيٍ مِنَ الطِّفْلِ فَإِنْزَالَةِ الْمَوَانِعَ مِّنْهُمْ عَادَ حَقُّهُمْ مِنَ الْحَضَانَةِ the right to physical custody does not belong to a slave, a fasiq, a woman, a married to a man, foreign to the child. Once those hindrances, or once the hindrances to the right of physical custody are removed, their entitlement to it, to physical custody, returns. So those are temporary hindrances. What are the temporary hindrances that we have talked about, slavery? This, which is like wickedness, uh, and, and then he said marriage in the case of the woman. Yeah, but once you become her, her stepfather, the stepfather at that time becomes, you know, when you say it's marriage to non mahram so what does that mean? Isn't that stepfather to the girl in, in, a, in a place, so he becomes a mahram now? Yeah, no, he has to be a mahram before the marriage. To, to, to before? Be, before the marriage. Why? What's the becomes the mahram once he's married to the child. Once the woman gets married to the child, the child becomes mahram to her kids. But the, what they're talking about here, otherwise, they will be talking nonsense. Because if they're saying, because every woman who gets married to a man, that man becomes a mahram to her children. But what they're talking about here, that she gets to be married to someone who is mahram, that he's already mahram before her marriage to him. Okay, that I'm he is. Say, what's the sense of, what's, what's the logic of that? I don't even know. What's the. the because the, they're. they're, they're be, be, because that, that man who is already mahram to the child is close enough to the child to be caring. You know, a stepfather may not necessarily be. Like, how we know it from the reality, the stepfather is not always compassionate towards the his step, stepchildren. Question. How can she possibly marry somebody who's already a mother? Wouldn't that make the child uncle or the grandfather? And isn't that prohibited? Okay. That's a good question, Zakir It's a good question. If she is a mother, then the options are limited. But if she is a grandmother, then the options are wider. But if she is a mother, what about the uncle of the child? Isn't the uncle of the child a mahram, paternal uncle, a ammil walad? In fact, a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and she said to him, Inna abi qad ankahani man rajulin ghayr amm waladi fa'ukhidha minni waladi. So a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and said to him, that my father married me off to a man other than the uncle of my child, so my child was taken away from me. So the Prophet ﷺ uh, annulled the marriage and allowed her to go marry the uncle of her child to keep the custody. So, yeah, but it is a good question. And uh, so, so moving on. Yes. What, what is it? What, what, yeah. The custody of um, means like the child, the mother, the child. Uh, it, I, we will discuss it in some more detail in just a minute here. So when we come to the mother who's get, who gets married, but let's get this out of the way. Slavery, let's get it out of the way. And here, this is basically not, not to be cruel to the slaves. It is to look for the best interest of the child because if the slave cannot, cannot have control over his own time or her own time, then they may not be available for the child who needs care. I mean, if they're owned by someone who has control over their time, then they may not be available. 
So that's why Imam Ahmad said that the part slave, part free, you know that a person could be on his way to freedom, part slave, part free. If he has free days, then he gets the custody on the free days. Or if she has free days, then she gets the custody on the free days. But, so that's why they said, لا حضانة للرقية. There is no hadana for a slave. ولا فاسق. ولا فاسق الفسق by agreement with uh, will disqualify you from hadana. However, however, Ibn Abdin said that if the, we if we are give the hadana, we here meaning the Hanafis and Malikis, not the Shafi's and Hanbalis. If we're given the hadana to the non-Muslim, how come we're not giving it to the Fasid? And then he's he said that this means that what it, the scholars meant by Fasid, الذي يخشى منه ضياع الفسق الذي يخشى منه ضياع الأولاد. The fist with which you have fear for the safety of the children, or the well-being of the children. Like, let us say, prostitution, for instance. Drugs, th things of that nature. That will not, uh, you know, people that will not have a safe household, safe environment, uh, things of that nature. So that is the fist that is talked about not the fisk in general. Because otherwise, if you take kids away from their passive parents, you know, you'll end up taking a lot of kids away from a lot of people. Sure, but isn't kufr, wouldn't kufr be more of a <clears throat> priority or have bigger of an impact on the child? We, we will come to discuss the issue of kufr and the impact of kufr, but if the mother, uh, if, if the non-Muslim mother, and that is what Hamza chose, because this is a controversial issue, and we said the Hanafis and Malikis gave the child to the non-Muslim mother, uh, the custody of the child to the non-Muslim mother, and their argument is based on, you know, two things, which we will come to this, but, but no, not necessarily, because if she is like a well-mannered woman, and she is, then the only fear that you will have is uh, whether she will be uh, sort of, uh, indoctrinating the child in her own religion and making the child so, sort of leave Islam, that will be the only concern. And if that becomes a valid concern, not just an imaginary one, then they will all say the child will be given to his Muslim father. They will all say. Keep in mind, we're talking here about conditions where you live in a Muslim land, in a Muslim majority land, where these rules may be applicable. But if you are living in a non-Muslim majority land, the secular court will make the decision. The secular court will make the decision because likely the non-Muslim mother will not come to the imam for arbitration. And to be realistic, then you will have to, the father will have just to make his best effort in teaching his kid about Islam, making his kid love Islam during, you know, as long as the kid is in his company. Whenever he gets the kid on the weekends or whatever, then that is his opportunity, that is his window of opportunity to not only teach the kid about Islam, but to make the kid also develop this affection, this allegiance. Uh, to uh, the religion. Okay, so so the, the, the slavery, fisk, and marriage. The marriage of the mother, all of these were mentioned by Imam al-Qudam, and then I will talk about the inferences that were not, that were not mentioned by the Imam al-Qudam, slavery, fisk, and marriage. The marriage of the mother. So the marriage of the mother, you know, why is it that the mother will lose custody when she gets married? Because then the father can say, you know, my kid should not be living, my daughter should not be living with her stepfather because uh, I am here. Or the, 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 my daughter could go live with her grandmother, or could go live with her aunt, or could go live with her, with my mother, or could come and live with me but I do not want my daughter and my son to be grown up with her stepfather. It does make some sense. 
But at the end of the day, it was already decided on by the Prophet ﷺ, where he said, you are more deserving than him unless you get married. If the father agrees, like I said in the beginning, it is between the father and the mother. No one has the right to get into the, the, this discussion if they agree among themselves. So the father decides, like I said, Omar ibn Abi Salama grew up with the Prophet. He was his stepfather. He was not related to him before marriage. He was not Mahkam. But the family, the paternal side of Omar ibn Abi Salama's family, left him to grow up with in the household of the Prophet. So if the father finds it appropriate, then it's fine, yes? Um, does the same rule apply if the child is really young? Let's say the mom got divorced while she was still pregnant and delivers the baby and remarries by the time um, the child is still breastfeeding. Does the father have a right to take money if it's a very young child? Yeah, Amja shows that the, if the child is still breastfeeding, that the child will still remain with the mother for the period of breastfeeding. And um, let's say even the child stops breastfeeding, but it's still Beyond this, then breastfeeding. the father will be, a, will be entitled, not necessarily entitled right away, because if the mother has a mother alive, oh, okay, so then she is next. Then the father will not be taking the child himself, but would be demanding that the child would be moved to the next of kin, which is her mother. Unless you get married, unless you get married. Well, the Prophet said to the, this to a woman who came to the Prophet and said to him, uh, Wait a second. كان بطني أو كان ثدي له سقاء وبطني له وعاء وحجري له حواء وإن أبي وإن أباه يزعم أنه يأخذه مني قال أنت حق به ما لم تكن. A woman came and she presented, you know, her case very eloquently and she said to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, this child of mine, my womb was a vessel for him, my. My breasts were his water skin, uh, uh, which is, you know. And my lap was a cradle for him. And my lap was a cradle for him. And his father claims to take him away from me. And the Prophet said to her, You are most deserving, or you're more deserving of him unless you get married. Unless you get married. Now, the four mazahib took <clears throat> this hadith and applied it uh, across the board. The majority of the scholars, they applied it across the board. The popular position in the four mazahib, popular position in the four mazahib, is to apply this across the board whenever she gets uh, married. With the exception of getting married to someone who is mahram to the child someone who is uh, related to the child, then they will disagree over, you know, uh, her, her entitlement uh, or the father's entitlement to moving the child away from her household to the next of kin or the next in the order of deserving uh, relatives. <clears throat> this particular hadith, was reported by Amr ibn Shu'ayb on Abihi on Jadd. And just to, to give you like a taste of, you know, the discussion. Because uh, if I tell you that Imam ibn Hazm, uh, if I tell you that Imam ibn Hazm did not act on this, and Imam ibn Hazm said that the mother will never lose custody. And this has been even reported from Osman ibn Affan, and it was the position of Al-Hasan al-Basri. Ibn Hazm picked it up, supported it, and he argued against the, uh, the position of the four 
<clears throat> that he says, and Mahazm said, that the mother will never lose custody. So if I tell you this, and there is this hadith, then Mahazm is just arguing with the Prophet But Mahazm would never argue with the Prophet. Mahazm was a literalist, meaning that he would just take whatever the Prophet said and not, you know, not even try to find like any implication other than the apparent of the text of Revelation. So, but the reason why Ibn Hazm did not act upon this is that this particular chain of narration, which is from Amr ibn Shu'aib, from his father, from his grandfather, is a very sort of controversial chain. A lot of scholars uh, did not accept it, and a lot of scholars, the, most of the latter scholars accepted it. And in fact, in the four Mazahib, you will find positions that are based on the hadith of Amr ibn Shu'aib and Abihi Amjad. However, the earlier scholars of hadith, they, they debated this left and right. Some people considered it not authentic, some people considered it authentic, and Imam Ahmad and some of the other scholars, they considered it authentic unless yatafarrad, unless he comes up with a hadith by himself that is unlike the other hadith, uh, which eventually, for the majority of the scholars, like the Habi, like Ibn Hajar, like Ibn Taymiyyah, for the majority of the latter scholars, they consider the, the, the ranking of the Hadith of Amr ibn Shu'ib al Nabi and Dadi to be Hassan or Qawi, which is somewhere in the middle between Da'if and Sahih, but within acceptable, the acceptable ranking of a Hadith, Hassan or Qawi. Qawi, in the, the, the terminology of Ibn Hajar, is when he wants to say a little bit more than Hassan. He just like wants to push it a little bit above Hassan. So he would call it Qawi. Uh, okay, why did they disagree over this chain of narration? Because Amr ibn Shu'aib, what is Amr ibn Shu'aib's name? His name was Amr ibn Shu'aib ibn Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Laws. So his name is Amr ibn Ibn Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Ibn Amr ibn al As. We don't need to go all the way up to Amr ibn al As. We, we, we just we need to go up to Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As because he's also a Sahabi and he is the one that is relating from the Prophet, not his father Amr ibn al As. But then when Amr ibn Shu'aib said, when it says Amr ibn Shu'aib on Abi Hanjad, Amr ibn Shu'aib would say, my father told me that my grandfather said that the Prophet said such and such. Right? He would be saying, because Amr ibn Shu'aib would not be saying on Amr ibn Shu'aib on Abi Hanjad from Amr ibn Shu'aib from his father. So Amr ibn Shu'aib would be saying from my father, from my grandfather. So they said, some of the scholars said, well, Amr ibn Shu'aib, this is his father here. Shu'aib is his father. And his grandfather is Muhammad. And Muhammad never heard anything from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi then whatever Amr ibn Shu'aib is relating through this chain is Mursad. There is, you know, disconnect between the Prophet and the next narrative. Because Muhammad never heard anything from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they're saying, okay, so, so the other thing is, they're saying, let us say, let us say that Amr ibn Shu'aib was saying from my father, from my grandfather, and he meant by his grandfather, Abdullah. He meant by his grandfather, Abdullah. So he's saying from my father, from, my, from uh, yes, which means, from his grandfather, but he would call it Jaddi also, because you call for your great grandfather Jaddi. You know, you, you call your like seventh mother. great grandfather Jaddi also. So <clears throat> here, and so the, some of the scholars said, well, then, then Shuai did not hear from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Laas. We're missing Muhammad here in the middle. Shuai did not hear. But in, you know, the verifying scholars said that Shu'aib was alive 
when, when Abdullah died, Muhammad ibn Ras was five was 30 years old. So they say, they say that it's not imaginable that Shu'ai would have not learned from his grandfather. They used to start learning at age seven, and, you know, 10 and, uh, and so on. Uh, so if he died at age 30, uh, if he died when Shu'ai, if Abdullah died when Shu'ai was 30 years of age, then Shu'ai must have heard it from him. The other problem is that they, they're saying that, that Abdullah uh, ibn Amr left the Sahih al sadiqa the scriptures where he used to write. And Am uh, found the Sahih al sadiqa And he did not hear everything from Sahih al sadiqa from Shu'aib, but he started to relate from the scriptures, from the manuscript that uh, his great grandfather left without hearing directly from his father, which would be more the hadith because this al-wajada is different from sama. To find the manuscript is different from hearing directly from an narrator from another narrator. They used to place, they used to have higher regard for the hadith that you heard from the narrator and you heard from another narrator. But in this particular scenario, you're just not finding any manuscript. The manuscript that your grandfather cherished more than anything else, where he said that there are two things that uh, keep me enjoying life. Sahif al-Sadiqa wa al Two things that keep me enjoying life. This manuscript that I wrote from the Prophet ﷺ in al is a piece of land that his father had donated, given in charity, so he was taking care of it for the char charitable cause. Uh, so the, these are two things that just keeping me enjoy, keep, or keeping me um, enjoying life. So, <clears throat> so this wajada is like really it's just not, not like any manuscript that he found. It is something that was like kept in the family, cherished, protected, preserved, highly regarded within the uh, family. So it would actually strengthen his reporting, and it should not uh, weaken it. And some of them, they talked about, you know, Amr ibn Shu'aib reporting manakir or reporting strange, weird uh, reports through this very uh, chain. But the argument was made for the chain afterwards that whenever there are manakir, it is likely because of weakness here. Whoever is reporting from Amr ibn Shu'aib on Abi Hamzad. And if you remove any weakness here and take only the strong chains all the way up to Amr ibn Shu'ai, you will find that there will not be uh, manak here. Yes, sir. So those that say that this hadith was found, the manuscript of the Wijada, what do they do with the Anan? They say he's referring to the Wijada that was passed down? Yeah. Because Ahan is not very clear in, in uh, you know, hearing the report directly from the narrator. So basically he's saying, I got this document from my father who died from his grandfather. Yes. So he's reporting something that he read, not something that he heard. But like we said, you know, Amr ibn Shu'aib himself is is thiqa. So we should, but the, anyway, so that, but the reason why I'm saying all of this is to understand that when someone says, when someone like Imam al-Hazm says, no, she is entitled forever, and even if she gets married, he's not showing defiance to the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa and you would not expect any of our Mustahid Imams to do that. It's just this, he did not accept Amr ibn Shaiba Nabi Hamjad. Many scholars, al-Bukhari did not accept Amr ibn Shaiba Nabi Hamjad. Many scholars did not accept Amr Shai. We have conflicting reports from Imam Ahmed, uh, but sometimes the reports are to take from Amr Shai and Abiyam Jaddi unless he reports Manakir or like uh, eccentric you know, reports. And sometimes it is to, to just take from Amr Shai and Abiyam Jaddi. And we said that the four Imams have rulings based on the hadith of Amr Shai and Abiyam Jaddi. So if we act upon this, then we will have these two positions. Uh, and then 
you know, aside from the, the, these two positions at the, both ends of the spectrum, she will lose it once she gets married to anyone. She will lose it. Uh, she will never lose it. Then we have two positions in the middle. She will lose it. She will lose it. She will lose the custody of her sons once she gets married to anyone. But she will not lose the custody of the daughters. And that's the position, the Maliki position, or in the Maliki method. She will lose it if she gets married to a foreign man, but she will not lose it if she gets married to a mahram man, or a, a, one of the child's kin, a man from the child's kin. And then, even within that position, they disagree. And that man, so some of them would say that man, should be just related to the child, even if he's not mahram, the cousin of the child, not mahram. But still, she will be able to keep the child. And that is a position within the Hanbali Mazhab. And then you have another position that says, no, he should be a mahram. And that's in the Hanafi Mazhab. And then you have a third position that says, no, he should not only be a mahram, but he should also have wilada which means that he should want to be one of the ancestors of that child. How could that be? Mm -hmm. well, if she is the maternal grandmother, she could marry the paternal grandfather of the child. What's wrong with that? And then, yeah. So they could marry. And in this case, she would never lose the custody because according to the, that stringent position in, in, in defining the, you know, uh, the relationship between the, the stepfather and the child, Wilada, so he is a, a father to the child, a grandfather to the child, so we'll be fine. Anyway, um, at the end of the day, what, you know, what Amjad shows from all of this is that, you know, the mother would be entitled if there is a necessity to keep the child with the mother. The mother would be entitled if they agreed on keeping the child with the mother. The mother would be entitled if the child is breastfeeding. And if the child is not breastfeeding and there is no necessity in keeping the child with the mother and the mother gets married, then the father does have the right to have the child moved to the next of kin. The next of kin is her mother. So the child would go to the maternal grandmother. Okay. Keep in mind, we said in the beginning that no mother, no parent, no mother or father will be prevented from seeing their kid. We're talking about custody. Who's keeping the kid most of the time? Who's, you know, wh which, which home the kid calls home? Which household the kid calls home? But visitation will be the right of the parents and no parent will be prevented from seeing uh, her or his kids. Yes? I just want to make sure I understand clear with uh, Imam Malik. Mm -hmm. The only one that allows uh, the mother to keep the child with the children even though she's married, regardless she's married to Muhammad or not Muhammad. Did I understand that right or no? No, Imam Ibn Hazm. Imam Ibn Hazm. Yeah, he would allow the woman to keep because Imam Ibn Hazm decided not to act upon this hadith because this chain of narration to him is not reliable. But we said that the majority of the scholars, particularly the majority of the latter scholars of hadith and the fuqaha are always using the hadith of Amr ibn Shaib al and because those hadith are like the Hassan, uh, which is still acceptable. Uh, yes? Yeah, we're, this is coming. We're, we're, we're going to talk about it when we talk about the end of custody. But in addition to those three uh, hindrances that Imam Ibn Qudama mentioned, what are the three hindrances Imam Ibn Qudama mentioned? Slavery, fisk, and marriage. Those are three hindrances. There are some other hindrances that will make you disqualified. And some of them are by consensus. Insanity will make you disqualified by consensus. Right? Uh, and you, yeah, there should not be uh, some, any argument about this. However, however, 
they're always in, you know, so the, the, the details are always problematic. We got insanity. So what if someone gets insane sometimes, every once in a while? The Maliki said that we'll leave the child with them until they get insane, and then we'll take the child away if we fear for the child's safety. You know, some people could, like, get bouts of, you know, mania, and between the bouts of mania, they're, they're functioning pretty well. So when, when their bouts of mania disqualify them from custody all the time, according to the majority of the scholars, yes, because you never know when it comes and he has his child. But the Maliki said, if there are bouts of insanity, then the, 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 the most deserving will be still deserving of custody when, they have, when they're having a good time. You know, like a normal uh, time. Then, uh, in addition to insanity, which is by agreement, uh, you know, aside from this little Maliki position about you know, periods of wellness, but insanity is by agreement. <coughs> then incapacity is another issue that was mentioned by the Malikis and Hanbaris. Malikis and Hanbaris, they mentioned the issue of incapacity, physical incapacity, such as blindness, for instance. So if you have you know, a blind parent or a blind uh, relative uh, and a non-blind you know, blind relative, they said that you would give it to the one who's not blind or the one who does not have the incapacity or handicap or disability because they will be able to take better care of the child. That is the, the, the Maliki's uh, and And then, keep in mind, you may think, you know, how could you do this? How could you say this? They are looking for the best interest of the child. That is what matters to them. They don't have any agenda or any prejudice Again, as someone who's blind or someone who is anything, they would not. You would not expect them of them. They're just looking for the best interest of the child. And oftentimes, you may not be able to really appreciate the, the reasoning of the scholars, but you have to think good of them. Yeah, okay, so insanity, incapacity, contagious diseases. We even do this in medicine. We even keep the kids away. Like if a mom, mom has t TB, for instance, we keep the kid away and to, to, you know, she starts her, start her own treatment and stuff like this. Uh, the PPD is positive, which indicates possibility of TB. We try, we keep the kid away even right after birth. The child is kept away from the mother until you get a chest X-ray. We verify it's active or not active. So, so that it. It's pretty reasonable line of thinking, contagious diseases. And that is according to the Malikis and Hanbaris. They are the ones who consider contagious diseases to be a disqualifier. If the disease is something that's not curable, if it's like, for example, HIV or something that the parents but you're not gonna you're not gonna give HIV to your kid. Well, I mean, you never know, you can accidentally cut yourself. I mean no, it, it, there has to be some a real fear for the safety of the child. So the, the route of transmission has to be such that you could actually give it to the child. You could cough and give them TB, for instance, or you have like leprosy, for instance, and if you touch them, you could give it to them. But uh, so, so, so it has, there has to be real fear for the child. So all of these are uh, hindrances. Now we come to the uh, one that is particularly relevant nowadays for us here, which is this belief. So if this, if, if the mother uh, is not Muslim, then the Hanafis and the Maliki said, we still give her the children. Uh, and then they said, we have two proofs. One is irrational and one is textual. Which one is textual? They said that the Nasa'i reported from Hamid, Abdul Hamid ibn Jafar al-Ansari from his father, from his grandfather, that his grandfather accepted Islam and brought his child to the Prophet. 
He's accepting, he accepted Islam. His wife did not accept Islam. He brought the child to the Prophet to dispute over the child. And the Prophet Wallahi, this is, look at the sense of justice. The Prophet sat the child between his father and mother. And then the, the, the Prophet gave the child the choice between his father and mother. But meanwhile, the Prophet was saying, Allahumma hadi qalbi. Well, Allah guide his heart. And then the child leaned towards his father, and his father took him. So all the child the prophet did is actually to make dua that the child would be guided to the right decision. So anyway, in the Malikis of Hanbalis, they say that had it been haram to give custody to the non-Muslim mother, the, child, the prophet would then have not given the child the choice in the first place. Shafi'is and Hanbalis would rebuttal this and say that the Prophet's da'wah was mustajaba and the Prophet knew that if he supplicates to Allah to guide the heart of the child, that he will be guided. The Hanafis and Malikis would rebuttal this by saying, but this is not applicable in the realm of rulings, laws and rulings. Still, had it not been permissible in the first place, the Prophet would have not given the choice to the child in the first place. And they say that we also have the rational proof, which is that the fact that she is not Muslim does not really take away from her compassion and love for her children. And she would be most qualified to take care of them because she has what is called wafratu al-atifa, or al-atifa al or, you know, affection, uh, abundant affection for the child. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when Omar ibn al-Khattab disagreed with his wife, she was not, she was Muslim by the way, Omar's wife was Muslim, but when Omar disagreed over his, his son Asim, and they went to Abu Bakr to judge between them, Abu Bakr said to him, رِيحُهَا وَشَمُّهَا وَلُطْفُهَا خَيْرُ لَهُ which Omar used to be the chief justice during the time of Abu Bakr. So you can imagine that the chief justice is coming to Abu Bakr because he would not rule for himself. So he is going uh, like higher. Uh, and he was going to Abu Bakr to judge between him and his wife. Uh, they're disputing over their son. And Abu Bakr said to him that her smell or, or you know, her odor, her smell, وَحِجْرُهَا and her lap are better for him than you. Uh, or لطفها, and her gentleness or her, her affection are better for him than you. So that would still apply to a non-Muslim woman. You know, she would still have affection for her child. They said that the only caveat here is that she may take the child to the you know, their temple, or their, and she may sort of dissuade the child uh, away from Islam, or, you know, get the child out of the deen, and things of that nature. And in this case, they said that the child would be given to his uh, Muslim father. Uh, here, in America, that discussion is not applicable, because a non-Muslim woman would not come to the imam to, to, for arbitration in the first place. This case is going to the secular court, and we said what the, the father needs to do at this time is just to make, you know, to, to put in his best effort whenever he gets the child on weekends or whenever the child is in his company to teach them about Islam and to make them love Islam and develop allegiance uh, to Islam and to the Muslims. Yes? Sorry. Uh, aside from the discussion about Marrying a non okay, to be a non Muslim woman outside of the, the lands where Muslims are the majority. If it does happen, um, would we then, uh, or should we then stress on the person to try and stipulate in the marriage contract that children are his? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You should. You should do this. No. To stipulate that he was in the prenuptial agreements. Will this stand? Will this hold? Uh, Depends who's present. Here is a lawyer. 
it, uh, yeah. it usually doesn't. It would not hold. Yeah. I mean, unless they agree to arbitrate with the Muslim body. Okay, so then the next point here that Imam ibn Qadama, that w then we, we come to the point of the end of Hadana. We come to the point of the end of Hadana. So, you want to take five minutes off? Okay, five minutes break. Okay, Bismillah. So, Imam ibn Qadama, rahimahullah, here. We're moving, uh, we're, we're going to go over the end of the custody now. And uh, when does custody end? At what age does custody end? Imam Ibn Qudama said, Rahimahullah, Wa iza balagha al gulamu sabah sinin kuyira bayna abawayhi fakana inda man ikhtara min huma, wa iza balagha til jariya tu sabahan fa abuha haqqu biha. When the boy reaches the age of seven years, he will be given the choice between his parents and then he will be with whomever he chooses. When the girl reaches seven, the age of seven years, her father will be more deserving of her. So, Imam ibn Qudama said, and that is the popular position of the Hanbali Madhab, that the end of the end of Hadana for the woman is seven years. Once the child reaches the age seven, if the child was a boy, the child chooses. If the child was a girl, the girl goes to her father. What's the reasoning behind this? Is that now she's close to the age of marriage. And it will be her father that will be receiving, you know, proposals, and it will be the father who will be talking to suitors. That's one rationale. The other one is that women, you know, daughters need more protection. So the father will be more protective of his honor than, let's say, the stepfather or whoever else, uncle, aunt, and so on. So as a girl, she will be better protected by her father, who is most protective of his honor. Um, that's the rationale here. But that's the Hanbali position. What about the Shafi'is? What did the Shafi'is say? And, and there is also a, they also have textual sort of not proof, but they also deduce this, or at least they're saying that wherever the Prophet ﷺ gave the choice, the scenario was about a boy, not a girl. Right? There are two hadith. This hadith of Abdul Hamid ibn Jafar, or Abdul Hamid ibn Salama al-Ansari, and the hadith of Abu Huraira, where the Prophet ﷺ gave the choice to the child. And in these two hadith, the child in dispute, like in dispute, was a, a boy, not a girl. So the Hanbali said, well, this applies to boys, but for girls, fathers will be more protecting of them. Fathers will be receiving proposals. Fathers will be talking to suitors. Fathers will need to be the ones during this transition from childhood to ladyhood. Uh, the the Shafi'is the Shafi said, as far as the, the, the choice, we said Abdul Hamid ibn Jafar, and then there is this hadith that's reported by Abu Dawood from Abu Hurairah that a woman came to the Prophet وسلم, and said to him, Innabni hada qad nafa qad saqani min bi'r ibn Abi Anaba wa nafa'ani wa inna abahu yuridu an yantazi'ahu minni. My son, my, this son of mine had you know, uh, basically brought me water from the well, a certain well, and uh, and nafani, and he's useful for me. He's beneficial for me. Uh, he start he started to, to help me out. He's become helpful, beneficial, and his father wants to take him away from me. And then the Prophet sallallahu said to them, "Stay him cast lots for him." And then the father said, 
the, the Prophet ﷺ, who's disputing or who uh, could dispute with me over my own son? And then the Prophet ﷺ said to the child, this is your father and this is your mother. So take whichever one, uh, whichever one you please from them by the hand, or take hold the hand of which, uh, whomever uh, you please. So the child held his mother's hand, so she took him and uh, walked away. Uh, so, so eventually the child chose his, mom, his mother, which would be expected. Uh, so that is the basis of, upon which Imam Ahmad said the, the, the child gets to choose. And uh, Imam al said that the, that choice will be given to both, the, the boy and the girl, because Imam al said that there is no difference here, consequen consequential difference. So this hadith, although the scenario, uh, you know, the, 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 the child involved in this scenario was a boy, but it will still be applicable generally, so we will apply it to boys and girls. The Imam Malik, the Imam Malik said that the boy will continue to be with his mother until he reaches puberty. And he was particularly in this uh, topic, you know, the, 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 the sisters will love an Imam Malik more. Because he said the boys until puberty, the girls until they get married, will stay with their mothers. So that was the position of Imam Malik. Uh, then an Imam Abu Hanifa said seven and nine. And why did Imam Abu Hanifa said seven about the boy? Because that is the age of discernment. And why did he say nine about the girl? Because that is the age of Yeah, that is the age where the, the sort of the lower age for uh, you know, the possibility of getting married. That is when she becomes desired by men. That is when she needs the protection of her father because he, was, he would be most protective of his honor. And since we don't have clear cut proofs, even the hadith that talk about the choice, the, you know. This, is, this would be in, in a matter of disputation. And the Prophet said first, he cast lots, and then he said, make the choice. So it, it is not really clear cut. Uh, so there is room for flexibility here. And Amja, I think Amja chose the position of Imam Malik, right? Yeah. And then after, uh, puberty for the boy, he gets to choose. Then, so is that clear? When does the, you, you got confused. When does the Hadana end? Let us remember that no scholars said the Hadana ends before the age of seven for anyone, boy or girl. The first seven years are with mom. Yeah. al al it's, it's a type of ajma'a. al 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 Remember that the, the, the madhab that is most in favor of maternal custody is madhab imam malik. The boy until he reaches puberty, the girl until she gets married. Shafi will give the, at seven, will give the choice to, to the boy or the girl. Uh, Ahmad will give the choice to the boy. Keep in mind that Imam Ahmad within his madhab and reports from Imam Ahmad also, they have. He has other positions also, so, uh, but, but this is the popular position. And Imam Abu Hanifa has the seven and nine, uh, which used to be the law in Egypt and countries that are based, but they changed it. It is different now. It is more, more Maliki implied. Yes. 
Yeah. For the magic piece, so it says that the female that tells she gets married. But when she gets married, there's no signal. There's no custody in the first place because now she is in custody of her husband. Yeah. We're talking about the age of marriage. No, until she gets married, that is when the custody ends. Of the mother. Of the mother. So the father never ever has custody. Oh, never. No. Uh, you know, according to the Malikis, the father will not get custody. Keep in mind, this is the unmarried mother. No, I understand. Oh. Okay, so now arrangements for visitation. Mm -hmm. For the boys until he should age of puberty, and then he chooses. Chooses. Okay. Yeah. The girl until Yes. And that's what she chose for Amja? Yeah, yeah, that's what she chose for Amja. Yes. That is the Amja. Um, Yeah, because I remember during the discussion, you know, everybody was saying, well, let's get go and go Maliki here and just give it to them. <laughs> anyway, arrangements for visitation. The scholars of the past said that if the child stays with his mother, his father would be entitled to take him during the day to escort him to the Quran school and teach him a craft, etc. So when we talk about physical custody, we're talking about you know spending the nights with mom, but we're not talking about severing the child from his father, or, you know, removing the child away from his father. In fact, she cannot travel with the child unless she is permitted, and if she travels, she leaves them with the father. Except in the Hanafi Madhab, in one scenario, if she travels back to where the marriage contract was, uh, you know, where they, they, they you know, conducted the marriage contract. So if she travels back to the city or the town where the marriage contract was conducted, then she will be, she, she can take the child. Because the Hanafis say, that if he got married to her in this particular city, then that is an implicit indication that he is, uh, is he's okay with his child growing up in the city. And then, also, they said, the Hanafis said, if, the, if she takes him within the distance of Qas, if he, she moves within the distance of Qasr, where his father would be able to see him with it, within the same day and go back home. Uh, then in this case, she can take him. Only if she is moving from al qariya ila Misr, but not from Misr ila qariya. Only if she is moving from a village to a city. Now that she's moving from a city to a village. Yeah, because the, their main concern here is the best interest of the child. The city will have more opportunity for the child, for his education, for his refinement, for his learning of etiquettes, and so on. So they were always concerned with the you know, opportunity for the child, safety for the child, and so on. So if she decides to move from a village to a city where there's more opportunity for the child, you know, a city where he could like bump into a Mohanifa and Sufyan Tawri and stuff like this, or Kufa, versus, you know, the, the child growing up in some place where, you know, there is no one important, no one uh, beneficial. Uh, it makes sense. Does that apply Okay, so, so that, is why we, that is why we said here nowadays the arrangements may be different due to the changes in reality. Most people live in large cities where the division of the nights and days between the parents may not be feasible. So the child may be given to one parent during the weekends and not the other parent during the weekends, days, weekdays, weekends. And this is article number 219 from the Amja Family Code. When the child is in the custody of one parent, the other is entitled to visiting him or her, being visited by him or her, and meeting him or her according to a mutual agreement between them. 
However, the parents must be careful to avoid being alone together, together after a divorce has made them foreign to one another. If they dispute the matter, uh, is referred to a judi judi judiciary, which will determine windows of visitation and set the time and place uh, in a fashion that will prevent loopholing in its execution as best as possible. Article 20, regardless of whether these visitations are established by agreement of the parents or a judicial verdict, when new circumstances arise that cause such arrangements to be harmful to either party or the child, the matter is referred back to the judiciary to decide whatever is most suitable. That could involve adjusting the visitation format, voiding the right of custody when agreements are breached, or when there is loopholing in the execution of the agreed upon or decreed visitation format. Okay, keep in mind that no one would be prevented from seeing their parent, but Imam Ahmad said, particularly for the boy here, that the boy could keep on moving back and forth as much as he wants. You know, so he chooses his father and then he chooses him. They also said that if someone gives up the Hadana, he can ask for it any time afterwards if he's more entitled. And that's the position of the majority. So if you give up the Hadana, you could go back and ask for it if you were more uh, entitled. Uh, so in, in this case, it will have to be mutual agreement and it will, the arbitrator or the judge will have to take in consideration the variation the, the, the variables of the time and place. Because whatever, you know, what, whatever context the, the scholars, the earlier scholars uh, were, were legislating for or they, they were given their fatawa for is completely different from our context. The idea of the, you know, the father taking his kids in the morning to the kutab and, and so on and bringing them back before sunset so that you could spend the night with mom is an idea that is not doable nowadays, not only in New York, but in Cairo, not only in Cairo, in Tanta, uh, not only in Tanta, in, uh, you don't know Tanta. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Tanta is like a smaller city in Egypt. Uh, but in, in, in even smaller villages, uh, now in, in different Muslim countries, it's just different. So there, the judge will preside over this meeting and bring the concerned parties and just reach a mutual agreement on the basis of what <coughs> mother's greater entitlement to custody and the fact that the father should not be you know, uh, kept away from his children. So the judge may decide four days, three days, weekend, weekdays, whatever they, they decide, vacations, etc. Now the last point here in this particular chapter is about money. And here uh, men <laughs> are basically responsible, regardless of being entitled or not entitled. They are less entitled, more responsible in this chapter. So the financial responsibility of men does not only stop at you know, breastfeeding being responsible for getting a wet nurse for their uh, children, but it is also they're responsible for the hadina. They'll pay the hadina, they'll pay the custodian, even if she fights and she takes the kid away from them, they'll still have to pay her to provide custody for their kids. But that is according to the majority. Imam Malik said no one. Nowadays we will have to figure out a formula that is fair, and we'll talk about it. But Imam Abu Qadama here said, وَعَلَى الْأَبِي أَنْ يَسْتَرْضِعَ لِوَلَدِهِ إِلَّا أَنْ تَشَاءَ الْأُمَّ أَنْ تُرْضِعَهُ بِأَجْرِ مِثْلِهَا فَتَكُونَ أَحَقَّ بِهِ مِنْ غَيْرِهَا سَوَاءٌ كَانَتْ فِي حِبَاءِ الزَّوْجِ أَوْ مُطَلَّقَةً It is upon the father to provide a wit nurse for his child, except if the mother wants to feed him or her with the customary wages of someone like her, then she becomes more deserving of him than all others. This is true whether she is still married to the child's father or divorced. So even if your wife tells you, you know, pay me for breastfeeding. That's your wife, by the way. She's not divorced. Pay me for breastfeeding. You have to pay her for breastfeeding. 
Uh, so you have to pay her for two years for every child. And then she, you know, she has like a, four or five kids, so you may be paying her for eight or ten years. Minimum wage. Cost of very wages. <laughs> Uh, no, they, the scholars will not allow you to give formula in this case. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Anyway. Huh? Uh, even even if you have a volunteer. Okay. Okay. Is there any man who said, For Elam Yakula who Abun Walla man, for Allah or Sati, he adjured or die, he Allah Kadri Mirasi him menu? If the child had no father or wealth, then it is binding on his heirs, the child's heirs, to provide the compensation for the wet nurse in proportion to their shares of inheritance. But the compensation for the wet nurse is not the only compensation. There are three different types of. Uh, of financial obligations on the father, primarily, <coughs> and if the father is not around and the, he did not leave behind any uh, wealth for the child to be spent from on him, then on the heirs of the child according to their proportion of uh, inheritance. So the, the, you can imagine if this child died, who would inherit the child? You know, this, this, and that relatives will inherit from the child. Those relatives will have to spend on the child. You know, profit and loss go hand in hand, hand in glove. They go together. So if you're going to inherit from this child if he dies, then you spend on him when he's alive. If his father is not around and his father did not leave behind wealth to spend from on the child. So three financial obligations here. One of them, by consensus, is the maintenance of the child. That is as long as the child is in the custody of the mother. The child support, in other words. This is by consensus. The father will have to pay for child support, or the heirs of the child will have to support him if the father is not around and he does not have wealth to spend from. Second is breastfeeding. And that is, by consensus, they have to get like, someone to breastfeed the child, but the, the, there, there is no consensus that the mother will be entitled to breastfeeding even if you have a volunteer. That is the Hambari position. Hambari position says even if you have a volunteer, the mother will still be entitled to, to breastfeeding the child with wages, with compensation, despite having a volunteer who's willing to breastfeed without compensation. So that's another, the, the other financial obligation. And then the third financial obligation is basically compensation of Hadana itself, compensation for Hadana. Because the mother could say, even though she's the one who wants the Hadana, and she's asking for the Hadana, but she can come back and say, well, if I take care of the child, I'm not going to be able to go to work, so you'll have to spend on me so that I can take care of your child. In this case, the father will have to spend on her for as long as the child is with her. You, know, you could imagine, according to the Malikis, until the girls get married, and if she has like three or four girls, then he's stuck for good 20, 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, about this A or eight, uh, at least there will be seven years of spending here. Who said that there is no compensation for custody? She is the one who is asking for custody. So, who said there is no compensation for custody? Imam Malik. Imam Malik said no, she is not going to get compensation for custody. Hanafi, Shafi, Amham Bali, they all said she gets compensation for custody. <coughs> So, because Imam Malik gives, the, gives her custody forever, you know, until the girls get married, and then, you know, the boys, until the boys reach puberty, he said she does not get compensation for custody. Yet, he said she's entitled to spending 
from the kids' money if they have money, from the children's money, to spend on herself, from the children's money that are in her custody if they have uh, money. The rest of the scholars, Hanafis and Shafis and Hanbalis, they said that Ujrat al-Hadila, or the compensation for the custodial, or physical custodian al-Hadila, which, which is usually the mother, is binding on the father. If there is no father, it will be taken out from the wealth of the child if he has wealth. If the child does not have wealth to be spent from, then it will be taken out, then, then it will be binding on warasa, the heirs of the child, in accordance to their proportion of inheritance. <coughs> Well, that is the compensation for custody in the case of divorce. Yeah, but if, how does the child go But uh, keep in mind, if the woman is still married to the child's father, she's not entitled yeah, to... No, I'm just saying about the divorce. She's not entitled to compensation for custody. Otherwise, that would be like too greedy. She gets money for breastfeeding. You know, she gets money for taking... I understand <laughs> that, but compensation for custody is regardless of marriage or divorce. But in, in uh, she's still married. But Yes. Then how is that? The child doesn't have money yet. He's just a child. The, the, the parents, maybe he has the inheritance. Father is still alive, and he has the money. The father owns the money. Not necessarily. Or maybe the grandfather owns well, the money. We said, we said. The child will not go to the grandchild. It goes to the child. The mother, not the father. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Where did that come from? No. Lewis said the mother died and left the inheritance for the child, and the child is now with his maternal aunt. Okay. That's a child who has wealth. I know, but what is then, uh, I understand that, but what is the, what master's position for the compensation for custody for a divorced mother? The divorced mother, she... Keep in mind, I'm, I'm going to give you like another scenario that would be a little bit interesting. <laughs> but what if he doesn't have? Let us say that child got married and his wife died. Huh? Don't remove this from the recording. <laughs> the same child got married and his wife died. Yes, yes, yes. That's, yeah, from a Pepe yes. perspective, yes. yeah, the child could get married, his wife may die, he would inherit. But you didn't answer, you didn't, you didn't answer my question, though. Yeah, <laughs> say, I need money because I need to stay home and take care of the children, then the court, yeah, will force the father, if the court was Hanabi Shafi or Hanbali, or if the court takes the position of the Hanabi or Shafi or Hanbali in this particular issue, then the court will force the father to spend on the mother for the period of the custody of the children. If the court is not Iki, the court would say no. Nothing. You go out and work. I know, go get to work. Yeah, just like the court. Okay, I just told that I understand. Yeah. But the court. But I mean, so she gave her the children, which is really she is the if, 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 if the, if the, if the, if, if the child was married and his wife died, yeah. and now the child has wealth, the court would say to the mother, you want to stay home and take care of the kids? You could take bin ma'roof from their wealth and spend on yourself and them. Chef, uh, yes. if the father died, uh, would the khadana case change? Or it, is it for the mother always, even if he gets married? Or it will go again the same way if the, the father died? Well, if there is no disputation, if there is no disputation, <laughs> Then, in this case, that the children will stay with the mother. I mean, the grandfather or grandmother can't come and say, you get married and uh, we need uh, the children. Okay, so if she gets married, who is who's entitled? And that's a controversial issue. If she gets married, who's entitled 
to asking for the child to be moved from the household of the stepfather. The father or anything above, or anybody above the father. Anyone above the father in, in the order of priority will be, you know, according to some of them, it will be only the maternal grandmothers. According to some other madhahib, it will include the paternal grandmothers. According to some madhahib, the Hanafis particularly, they will give it to the khala and the ukht and the bint al ukht and everybody before the father. So, uh, so all of them, they can basically, they, they can contend with the mother over the custody if she gets married. Yeah. So anyone who's the father or above the father will be able, and that this is this is my, you know, this seems to be the stronger position. And if the father is uh, no more, uh, the financial responsibility goes to the maternal uh, uh, uncles, right? Uh, yeah. The financial, the financial responsibility will go to the heirs of the child based on their shares of inheritance from the child. So you look at the heirs. If this child dies, who's going to inherit from this child? X, Y, and Z. How much does X get from the child? Okay. So a child who does not have a father and a child who does not have a wealth of his own, who is spending on him? His heirs, his warasa. Who inherits from the child? If the child dies, X, Y, and Z. Z would get one quarter. X will get one, no, one quarter if he, if he was married, but it, it, which, which still could be possible. So, but, but, wait a second, no, one quarter, his wife will not be responsible to spend on him, because let's remove the one quarter. Let's say one sixth, uh, whatever, one third, one half, then based on this, Z will spend, well, we will determine how much that we need for the child every month. So we need like, what, $600 for the child every month? Z would have to contribute 100. This, you know, Y would have to contribute 200. And X will have to contribute 300. That's it. Now, this is in the Hanbali Madhab. In other Madhab, the grandfather will be solely responsible. Before we go to the Waratha and we make that division of you know, their contributions, the grandfather in other Madhab will be solely responsible. And in other Madhab also, the mother after the grandfather will become responsible. Yes? Can you patch up positions? Uh, so, so the the Marikis, for instance, will say you keep she keeps them until you know the girls until they get married. Can you force the the husband to spend on the mother who has custody over the ch children until the girls get married? Extremely controversial issue. You know, some of the scholars said that. The, the, the patchwork is, most of the contemporary scholars will allow patchwork, and patchwork is used all over the place, particularly in financial transactions. Uh, but many of the scholars will say that patchwork should not result in an opinion that would be repulsive to all of them, that will just not be acceptable to all of them. So if the patchwork makes us create a hybrid opinion that is between them, between them, then it is acceptable according to the majority of contemporary scholars. If the past position will make us get to an opinion that will invalidate this act of worship according to all of them, or that will be in the area of mu'amalat just not acceptable by any of them, 
then that patchwork is not acceptable. Here, the patchwork would get us into a very awkward position where this father, you know, he got like, he, uh, he had, she, they, they're divorced, she's on her own, and then we're asking him to spend on her until the, the girls get married. I think it would be unfair. Uh, now, the compensation for custody, the, the majority said that there would be compensation for custody. But let us say she went out to work. I mean, nowadays, she went out to work. She, you know, and sometimes also, because we, we have to be also, you know, it is not all about, you know, being nice to, to women. It's about justice, you know. So, so she went out to work. And she, she, she's, she works as a physician. She's an obstetrician. She makes $400,000 a year or more. And then this guy works as an engineer somewhere and he's making seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year or less or more, whatever. Or they make the same, or she makes a little bit less than him. But she's going out to work and she's putting the kid in some Havana or some daycare. Uh, or the kids are going to school and the, the bus comes by and picks them up and drops them off and so on. And then she tells them, well, I need, you know, compensation for custody. <laughs> you know, it, it, well, there has, to, there has to be some reasoning here. Uh, it, it, it is not like, yeah, yeah well, the majority said, yeah, she's entitled. But she's working, she's making money. And she's not staying with the kids all day, like they imagined during their time that the Hadena would be there uh, for the kids. And in this case, there would not be compensation for Hadana. There will be child support because the, the man is responsible for his kids. So he will pay child support until the kids grow up and be on their own. But to pay for his divorcee, you know, 10 years. Uh, you know, down from divorce, who's working and who's making more money than him would be utterly unfair. Well, wouldn't it be, wouldn't the question if she's working by choice? What? Wouldn't the question of if she's working by choice, or if she's forced to work, be brought to the table? I mean, if she's well, if she, why, what? Because she can't sustain herself financially. Wouldn't it? But, but keep in mind, we're saying that if she's not working, the more the majority will make him spend on her until the kids, uh, uh, until, until the custody ends. Right? She's not forced to work. The more will make her spend. Okay. Him spend on her, not only the kids. Okay. So she's choosing to go out to work. And if she is choosing to go out to work and she's putting the kid in some daycare or sending the kids to school, then why should he be paying her? I mean, it is understood that he should pay child support because these are his kids, but why should he pay his divorcee who's now working and making as much as he is or even more? Well, even the agreement is coming from here. Why? <laughs> the agreement is coming from this side of the aisle. So if that side of the aisle is agreeing, then that was <laughs> yeah. Because the, 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 okay, keep in mind, the sisters also, uh, they have their own sons and they should also have a you know, sense of justice. Yes? Uh, what if it, uh, the girls are three, four of them? Until marriage, it could be 30, 35, 40. Uh, and also the rental that he has to pay for until that time. He, that child right? support will be, keep in mind, if his girl has a wealth of her own because she's working, he's not required to spend on her. If his girl, his daughter, is not working, he will spend on her until she's 78 until she's 92. Uh, he's just, it's his daughter. Yeah, but what is she until she gets married, or dies, or um, uh, earns an income of her own. Or inherits one. Or inherits one. Mm -hmm. 
in, has a wealth of her own until she acquires a wealth of her own, gets married, or dies, he's spending on her. The son is different. They say that he is spending on his son until he's capable of earning. The son. When, when the son becomes capable of earning, the father will not be, which is a good news for all fathers. <laughs> You don't need to spend on your son, you know, for forever. Um, once he's capable of earning, then. But you have to put this in the proper context also. Like if you know your son is going to college and stuff, you don't throw your son out and tell him you're capable now of earning because you could go out and work in any place and make some uh, income and be able to eat and survive. Uh, but, but generally speaking, the, yes, the, the, the end of res financial responsibility of the father toward his son is capability of earning. The end of financial responsibility of the father towards his daughter is one of three. Actual earning, not, not capability, actual mm -hmm. earning, death or marriage. Yes, sister. The father of the divorced woman? The father would be responsible if she is not making income. But if the husband is paying her custody for custody, your compensation for custody, according to the majority who said that you should pay her compensation for custody, then the father would not need to spend on her because she's making income. Yes. Can child uh, stay with the custodian uh, uh, after the custody period? Uh, can he stay with the you know custodian, or if he wants to? The question. The question is, uh, what would be his obligation once he become uh, you know when he earns money? Uh, he will pay to the his actual parents, or he will pay to the custodian and foster care. Okay, so can the child choose to stay with the custodian after the custody ends? Yes, according to the Hanbaris uh, regarding the boy, and the Shafais regarding both, and no according to the Hanafis because the Hanafis do not, you know, give him the choice, do not give children any choices. The Hanafis would say seven for the boy, nine for the girl, they are with mom until seven and nine, and then they go to death. But according to the Shafi'is and Hanbaris, the, the, the child gets the choice. To, so they can stay with, and, and you know that the, the case with the Marikis, they keep the child with mom until the child, the boy reaches puberty. And puberty for them is basically being capable here, because once they have puber, reached puberty, they're considered adults, not children. And then for the, 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 the girls and the, the girl, uh, marries. And your other question is once they, they become, the, the, the child makes an income, well, are there what is his obligation? Can he pay to his real parents or his He does not need to pay to anyone unless they are in need. And if they are in need, then he should, he certainly should support his real parents who are in need. His foster parents, foster parents, this would be a moral obligation. It is not a legal obligation, but it would be a moral obligation. Let us say his foster parents were his maternal aunt and her husband. He grew up in the household of his maternal aunt and her husband, and they grew older. There is, there is an obvious moral obligation here. And as I said, it's not a legal obligation. It is not a legal obligation, it is an act of ahsad. Uh, but if it was, you know, if, if we're talking about the father, the father will take him to court. And the father will say, my son is making an income, I need money, you know, I'm entitled to take it from him. The mother could take him to court and say, 
my son is making income, I am in need, he should pay me. Uh, only when they are in need, according to the stronger position, which was the Hanbali position. But in other mazahib, they would even allow the parents to take from the child, even if they are not in need. As long as it does not harm the child. So they were saying, the other mother were saying, well, let's say the child is a millionaire, and his parents are in, not in need. They are just living a good life, but they want a little bit more, because their kid is making too much money. And can they go and, and ask for a little bit more? They grant them, the, grant the parents from the child's money, that which does not harm the child. So the ceiling for everyone is no harm to the child. And the judge would estimate what is considered non-harmful to the child. So if, 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 if you are whoever, name, if you, if you have, like your wealth is $4 billion, the judge will estimate what will give his poor father a hundred million, give his mother another hundred million. It's not going to harm him. Let them live a large life. It's their kid. That's it. Zakim Lachana, Spanish, 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 Sp